Okay, several questions here. Uh, what is the difference between being full of the Holy Spirit and being filled with the Holy Spirit? Well, um, same usage. I think it's from, yeah, Pratt. Um, we're going to learn about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which, uh, you know, uh, we, we looked at during the, um, during the orientation also. Uh, we're going to look at the difference between the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit and the infilling of the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So uh, when we study that, we'll, we'll actually talk about these differences. Um, and also, well, uh, you can look at John chapter 4, John chapter 7. Okay, uh, The fact that we have the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit, John chapter 4, salvation, and how the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit helps us to live a sanctified life, consecrated life, and so on. John chapter 7 talks about the river, mm -hmm. the river of God. And again, uh, it's talking about the work of the Holy Spirit um, flowing out like river rivers um, through the um, through through the person, right? And uh, so we're going to we, we will study that. So I just want us to hold those questions for now, right? How do we receive the baptism? We're going to look at that. Doctrine of sanctification, yes. Uh, prayer of salvation, yes. Uh, Romans chapter 10, verse 9. Okay, I know it's not related to the topic, but um, slight digression here. So Romans chapter 10, 9 talks about how we believe in our heart that Christ died for us and we declare with our mouth and then that is how we are saved. The Bible declares that. Uh, so we will... So that's how a person becomes saved. Is there any difference between the Holy Spirit upon a man and the Holy Spirit in a man? Yeah. So basically, you're talking about the indwelling and the baptism. We will talk. We'll talk about that. The speaking in tongues, a tangible evidence. Again, uh, I'll refer you to the resource that we studied during the orientation. I think Nidal, you were there, part of the orientation, right? So uh, we address these, but you can refer to. Uh, that book once again, the baptism in the Holy Spirit, and also the wonderful benefit of praying in tongues, where all these frequently asked questions are also uh, mentioned there. So you can refer to that um, for your reading once again, and this will be clarified. However, when we talk about the baptism in the Holy Spirit, uh, we will be referring these questions again. So maybe you can save these questions if it's not, you know, answered fully by, uh, you know, when you read these books, uh, we can have the discussion when we come to the topic. Is that okay? Right? Oops. Okay. Um, I, okay, I don't see a response here, but I, I hope that's fine. Right? Right? Okay, so I'm um, just <clears throat> a few um, words on what uh, Shani asked about uh, her question was about Luke chapter 1, 32, 34. You know, what does that mean? So we see that, um, see, that is also fulfillment um, of the, the prophecy about the Messiah, right? So we see that fulfillment of uh, uh, the, the prophecy that was. It was made over David, or the, or the messianic prophecy, saying that the Messiah will come from the line of David. We see that in um, 2 Samuel chapter 7, I think 12, 13, 14, uh, there, that it will be of David's line and of his reign, that he will, he will build a house for me, the Lord says, and um, his reign will be an eternal reign and so on. So um, right there, it's there is a reference to the, you know, to the Messiah who will come. So uh, here in Luke chapter 1, it is one of the references, right, referring back to the, the messianic prophecy that he will be great, he will be called the son of the highest, and then he will reign over, you know, the rightful... Uh, person to reign over the house of Jacob and uh, his kingdom, his rule and reign, there will be no end. It will be an eternal reign, right? Just wanted to mention that. <clears throat> okay. Any other questions pertaining to what we discussed in class? You know, I, I know that you might have a whole lot of questions, uh, you know, about the Holy Spirit. Uh, and and as we go through, you know, the the 
forthcoming chapters, we will actually be covering, you know, a lot of questions which Brad has asked, we'll be covering all that. So I'm not getting into it because it needs a context. It needs, uh, you know, looking at several scriptures and uh, in order to sufficiently answer, right? So we will address it when we come to those topics. But uh, what I would <clears throat> ask is why, um, you know, you can actually make a note of these questions also, okay. Look, 134, why does it say that he rules forever? Why does it say <laughs> House of De Jacob? Okay, okay, right. Uh, you know, the, the, the fact is that uh, the House of Jacob refers to the, the Israelites, you know, refers to Israel. So, uh, so that is what it means, right? I know several, the, the language of those times, language of today, there are differences. Uh, but when it refers to the house of Jacob, it's talking about the people of Israel, right? And so, uh, so that is what it is, collectively referring to the, you know, the people of Israel. So, see, uh, Shani, we, we we see a lot of things, um, you know, in usage, uh, in uh, you know, it's symbolic uh, ways, especially when it comes to the prophecy and so on. So, yeah, so that is how it is. But, but thank God we have the Holy Spirit who sheds light on all this and gives revelation. And we have scripture which interprets scripture. So, which points to the answers, right? Okay. Okay, any questions here, class, in person about what we um what we studied just now okay okay you know feel free to make a note of the questions especially you know if it is something that's um you know something that's always been on your mind about the holy spirit you know we can ask uh, you know when we come to those future chapters also right okay now uh, let's look at the second chapter okay uh, second chapter which talks about uh, well, we're going to look at the nature of God and how that applies to the Holy Spirit because He is God. Okay. And the fact that the Holy Spirit is a person. Okay. So I'm going to ask two questions now. Okay. So you tell me which is the right way to ask that question. Okay. First question. What is the Holy Spirit? Second question, who is the Holy Spirit? Which is the right question to ask. What is the Holy Spirit or who is the Holy Spirit? What do you think? Okay. How many of you are saying first question, what is the Holy Spirit? Is it a valid question? Okay. Right. I think Andrew says, who is the Holy Spirit? I think a lot of, yeah, who is the Holy Spirit? Right. So the thing is this, when we see in scripture, we see that the Holy Spirit, he is powerful, but he's not an uh, inanimate power, just like electricity or nuclear power, right? Or thermal power. He's powerful. He's God. But he's not an inanimate or something that is uh, and like an object. Right? We see that scripture, the Holy Spirit is referred to as a person. And we study that he has all the characteristics of a person. Because when we, many times, when we, when we study about the Holy Spirit, when we refer to the Holy Spirit, because, you know, the Holy Spirit uh, is referred to in the context of power, because you will receive power when the Spirit of God comes upon you and you will be witnesses, the Lord Jesus said. So there's a lot of association with power. Holy Spirit, power. Right? Fire, <clears throat> anointing, right? There's a lot of, you know, those kind of spectacular things associated with the Holy Spirit, with the work of the Holy Spirit. And so it is possible that in our understanding, we, we, 
we connect Holy Spirit with power. You know, I was filled with power. I, I felt the power, right? Uh, and uh, we, we sometimes miss out on the fact that the Holy Spirit is a person. Person, meaning he's not just power to be used or received for my own use, but he is a person to have fellowship with, to commune with. In fact, we are all invited to have the communion of fellowship, deep fellowship with the Holy Spirit. Okay. First of all, does the Holy Spirit have the attributes of God? Right? We're saying Holy Spirit is God. He's the third person of the Trinity. But does he have the attributes of God or characteristics of God? Like if you say, okay, this is who God is, or this is how God should be, God should have certain characteristics, okay? Which means, first one, that he should be beyond time and space. He should be present everywhere, omnipresent, right? Um, Psalm 139 and verse 7. Okay, if you, uh, you can turn there, Psalm 139, verse 7. Um, okay, maybe somebody can read also. I'm just going. Okay, Psalm 139, verse 7. It says, Where can I go from your spirit? Psalm says, Or where can I flee from your presence? Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? What is he implying? That there's no place that I cannot, I can go to where your presence is not there. Right? And he goes on to explain also. Right? So where can I? He's present everywhere. And that's why we use that word omnipresent, omnipresent, omnipresent. He's present everywhere. Okay, so that is one of the characteristics. So the, here, Psalmist is referring to the Holy Spirit and saying, that, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I go from your? Where can I flee from your presence? Which means that he is present everywhere. Secondly, he's all powerful. <clears throat> right? He's all powerful. If if we say the Holy Spirit is God, then he has to be all powerful. There cannot be someone more powerful than the Holy Spirit. Yes or no? <clears throat> like you can't have someone saying, okay, this person, this is God, but here we have someone who's more powerful than God. Right? It doesn't make sense. Like when we say God, that He is all powerful, right? Um, <clears throat> so Luke chapter one verse thirty-five, you know the, the reference which we said, um, talks about the fact that the power of the highest, right? The the angel says that the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest, which means that Holy Spirit power is of the highest, you know, there's nothing higher or there's nothing greater than the power of the Holy Spirit. So we can say that, yes, the Holy Spirit is omnipotent or all powerful. Okay. Thirdly, the Holy Spirit, if you're saying Holy Spirit is God, then he has to know everything. He has to have all the wisdom and all the knowledge. So he is all knowing. And then um, so we, this is what we see, 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 20. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, okay, let's go there. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and um, 10 to 11, sorry. Um, 10 says, the Spirit, God has revealed them to us through His Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. And what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of man who is in him, which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God. So, he's talking about the Father and the Spirit, saying no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God, meaning that the spirit of God knows everything about God, and God knows everything that there is to know. Okay? 
So, in fact, when we, when we learn about the work of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament, we see that the Holy Spirit has all the knowledge, has all the understanding, has all the abilities, um, which sometimes we think that, okay, only spiritual matters, only knowledge of the word, maybe. No, he knows everything that there is to know. And he's, and he's more than willing to share that or, or, or impart that knowledge and information to us. Okay, so we see that he is all knowing, he's omniscient. Okay, so he is God, he's, which means he is omnipotent, he is uh, omnipresent, and he's omniscient. Okay, so when we say omnipotent, what do we mean? He is all, all powerful. Okay, so when you say he's omniscient, which means he's all knowing okay and when you say his um, uh, omnipresent which means he is present everywhere he is everywhere right okay so we see several references the fact that he is holy spirit is god now so people we might have some questions so yeah that is fine but is there a direct reference in scripture pointing to the fact that the Holy Spirit is God. Okay, So let's look at Acts chapter 5. Okay, Acts chapter 5, verse 3 and 4. Acts chapter 5, verse 3 says, um, this is Peter having the conversation with Ananias, and then Sapphira comes and all that. So Peter saying this, um, 5 and verse 3, right? But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? While it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not in your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. Okay, so what, what, was, what did Ananias and Sapphira do? They actually sold land, which is a good thing, and they wanted to help in the ministry, which was a good thing. But they made it look as if they were actually giving the entire amount. Uh, they sold the land, and then they're giving the entire amount to the ministry. Um, but it was actually a portion of it. But they were actually, you know, the way it was portrayed was that uh, um, it, was, it was the whole amount, right? So... Um, so here we see Peter, you know, saying that, you know, why did Satan fill your heart to lie? Why did Satan fill your heart to lie? And then he says that you lied to the Holy Spirit. You lied to the Holy Spirit. And in verse 5, or verse 4, he says, you have not lied to men, but when you lied to the Holy Spirit, you lied to God. Okay. So, so what is he saying? You lied, and you lied to God, and you lied to the Holy Spirit. So, Holy Spirit is, in fact, God, but you lied to the Holy Spirit. Okay. Then, uh, Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 14. Okay, let's look at Hebrews 9. Um, okay, so, uh, Shani, he is all-knowing. Okay. So we looked at 1 Corinthians 2, verses 10 uh, and 11. So scripture uh, that we just read says that uh, when we, um, who knows the things of God except the Spirit of God? Okay. Which means that the Holy Spirit knows everything there is to know about the Father. And the Father knows everything there is to know because he is God. And therefore, you know, the Holy Spirit is omniscient. Okay, that is what he was saying, that he is all-knowing. The Holy Spirit is all-knowing. Right? Okay. Okay, let's look at Hebrews 9. Um, Hebrews chapter 9. And then verse 14. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal 
Spirit. Okay, so he's referring to the Holy Spirit as the Eternal. We looked at this verse, and we're looking at how the, the Trinity is there mentioned in redemption, right? So here you see that the Holy Spirit is referred to as the Eternal Spirit. What does Eternal mean? Is it a is eternal a short time frame or a long time frame? Right? It's long, long period of time. So here, yeah, it's forever. So here, the Spirit of God or the Holy Spirit is referred to as the eternal spirit. Okay. So referring to the Holy Spirit as an eternal being, someone from the eternal past to the eternal future. Okay, so we see that he's God, he's eternal. And 1 Corinthians 12, verse 6 also talks about the fact that he is all-powerful and uh, uh, is, is so sovereign. Okay, so let's look at 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 6. Okay, um, same God who works all in all, verse 11, same God, Spirit who works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills or as he decides. Okay, um, so it talks about how in, in the in the matter of the whole the gifts of the spirit and the distribution and so on that he is sovereign meaning he he doesn't have to consult in order to do certain things right? he is sovereign sovereign means that he decides he reigns he decides he is sovereign over everything so so we see that he is god he is eternal he is sovereign now, when we refer to the Holy Spirit as a person, we are saying that He, the Holy Spirit, is not just a inanimate force. It's not just a force, it's not just a power, just like all the other things that we see. He is a person. No. Why do we say that? Right? Why do we say that? It's because scripture talks about the fact that the Holy Spirit, He has, He thinks, He chooses. Uh, he he has emotions and so on. Okay, so firstly, let's look at one Corinthians chapter two and verse ten. Okay, one Corinthians two and uh, verse ten. Okay, right. If, if you can turn there, one Corinthians two verse ten. It says, "The God has revealed them to us." It's talking about what eye has not seen and ear has not heard. God has revealed them to us through his spirit. For the spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. Okay. The Holy Spirit searches all things. He reveals the deep things of God. Okay. So which means that he has an intellect. It's... It's safe to assume that he has an intellect. He's searching. He's receiving. And he is making known. And you need to have an intellect. You need to be an intelligent being in order to do that. Okay. So again, you know, it might seem like a, you know, a very simple thing. You know, why are we going looking into it? Because sometimes we make that assumption uh, that the Holy Spirit is just power. The Holy Spirit is just, you know, something to break down the forces of evil. And all that is true. All that is true. But the Holy Spirit is, it is intelligent. Or the Holy Spirit, he has an intellect. He searches. He makes known to us the things that uh, the mind of Christ and so on, right? Um, uh, let's look at Acts 15. Okay, uh, Acts chapter 15 and verse 28. Okay, Acts 15. So here we see something that um, the, the the disciples of the early church, right? They make this uh, in the letter that we that they write to the disciples uh, or the of the Gentile church in Antioch. They make this statement here. Okay, Acts chapter 15, verse 28. For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. So it means that 
they consulted, the disciples consulted with the Holy Spirit, spoke and asked and consulted with the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit decided and said, yes, you know, it seems good to me. Go ahead. Right? It seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things. Okay. So what 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 are they? You know, we're going to look at that a little later, but they were this is the Gentile church, and this is the early days of the church when the Holy Spirit was poured out upon the Gentiles as well. And um, and then you know there is a lot of um, uh, a lot of discussion uh, uh, and you know how what should we do and uh, can should the gentile church also be circumcised like the jews uh, and so on you know all these discussion and debate was happening to the body of uh, disciples who gathered there the apostles elders and the brethren and here um yes shani i see your uh, hands up do you have um a... yeah can you hear me yeah okay so I just have a question. So I just want to make sure I'm clear. I know you put the Holy Spirit has emotions, intellect. That's because the Holy Spirit um, is, is, is that's because the Holy Spirit is is God in the spirit form. That's what, from what you said, I'm understanding. And also that he is all powerful. So my question is, if he's all powerful, why is it that, you know, things happen? People get raped, kids get kidnapped. Mm. Sick, because I know usually people say when sickness is not of God's or the devil, but if He's all powerful, why mm. do bad things like that happen? Okay, okay. So Shani's question is, you know, if the Holy Spirit is all powerful, if, in other words, if God is all powerful, you know, why do bad things happen, right? If God is sovereign, why do bad things happen? You know, we just said, okay, one of the attributes of God is that He's a all powerful God. Then, then why is it that the world seems to be out of control, right? Um, okay. Uh, answer, quick answer is that yes, God has given us, God is all powerful, but in His sovereignty, He has also given us free will. Right? In His sovereignty, He's given us the power to choose to step away from Him, the power to do the things, um, the power to either to worship Him or not to worship Him, the power to, or the ability, right? I would say the ability to accept or reject the ability to follow what he lays down before us as guidelines and or the truth or to and the and the ability to reject it right so a lot of uh, very quickly suffering that we see okay it's it's a personal choice that we make it's a personal choice that people make a lot of suffering also happens because of satan's free reign we know that he has a limited time and he is a defeated foe, but he goes about stealing, killing, and destroying, and, and all that happens. So God is a good God. God is all-powerful. At the same time, he has also given us free will, right? So, um, so that is, uh, yeah, in short, I would say that is, that is the reason, right? So we can choose to follow him. We can choose to live by his guidelines and give by the truth and have a you know orderly society but people do have free will and God's will is never to make a generation of automated robots who will just you know do the right thing live orderly lives but he wants to give us the free choice to either accept him to worship him or to reject him you know that's the greatness uh, of God of the even the sovereignty of God Right. Okay. Uh, so he has an intellect. So like he knows, he, uh, you know, he, he knows, he searches. So it's, uh, so that's something that we need to understand. Right. Um, the other thing is that he also teaches. Okay. The Holy Spirit teaches. And uh, John chapter 14, it says that he, the, 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 the Lord Jesus, while talking about the Holy Spirit, um, this is what he says uh, about teaching about the Holy Spirit, John chapter 14 and verse 26. Okay, um, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things which I said to you. 
Okay, so who's who's going to teach? The Holy Spirit. Okay, so so it, it opens our eyes. Hey, the Holy Spirit is a person. The Holy Spirit has is intelligent. He has intellect. The Holy Spirit teaches. So, which means that I can learn from the Holy Spirit. So, the Lord says He will teach you everything, and He will also remind you of the things that I speak to you. Right. So, the Holy Spirit will teach us. The Holy Spirit will also remind us. He's a teacher. He's a reminder. Okay. Now, that's a wonderful ministry, right? Okay. Is the Holy Spirit and the Holy Ghost the same thing? Yes. Yeah. It's a different rendering. Um, yeah, of the same person, Holy Spirit and Holy Ghost. Yeah. Okay. So the Holy Spirit teaches us. The Lord Jesus says He will teach, which means that it we need to be taught. Right. We need to receive the teaching. We need to understand how He's teaching us, how He speaks to us, and also the Holy Spirit reminds us. What does remind mean? You remember, I spoke to you this, I'm reminding this to you. Okay, so he's telling the disciples, he will remind you of all these things that I'm teaching you. He's going to remind you, he's bring to your remembrance, bring back to your memory all the things. Okay, So that's a wonderful ministry of the Holy Spirit. He teaches and he reminds us. And this is possible only because he is someone with intellect. It's possible only because the Holy Spirit is a person. Okay. He testifies. He testifies about Jesus. Uh, John chapter 15. Okay, let's go to verse 26. The Holy Spirit, when the, when the Helper comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of Truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. Okay. So what does that mean? That means that... The Holy Spirit will testify, will point to Jesus and say, this is of the Lord. This is the Lord Jesus. This is, these are the teachings of the Lord. The Holy Spirit will testify of me. Okay. So we see that wonderful ministry, important ministry, important work of the Holy Spirit. Right? He teaches. He reminds. He testifies of Jesus. So how much more should the believer be dependent and receive from the ministry of the Holy Spirit? Right? So we need to, you know, that's why the Bible says, you know, commune. May the, uh, in, in, I think it's in, in Corinthians, right? It talks about the fact that, you know, have fellowship with the Holy Spirit. Commune with the Holy Spirit. Okay, the second thing that we see is that he has a will. Okay, what does that mean? That he chooses, he decides. Right? So we're, what are we learning? We are learning about the Holy Spirit being a person. And as a person, the Holy Spirit has intellect. The Holy Spirit has a will, which means he decides. Okay? He, um, he chooses, he decides. Um, let's look at that same um, verse. 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 11, he decides, you know, in a particular meeting, in a particular gathering, he decides, okay, this is how the gifts will be distributed. 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 11. Um, okay. The Holy Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. So here, uh, before the verses before that talks about the list of the gifts, okay, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and uh, talks about the fact that there are diversities of gifts, but it's the same Holy Spirit, different kinds of ministries, but it's the same Holy Spirit who enables these ministries and so on, right? So it says here that the Holy Spirit works all these things and he distributes to each one as he wills. That means as he decides right so he has a will third thing the holy spirit has emotions so the holy spirit is not you know someone who is without any 
emotion. Sometimes we have a picture of God as being very strict. Now, it depends on how we grew up, whatever experiences we had in life. Okay. Maybe God reminds us of our whatever school principal or school teacher, right? Um, very strict, maybe with a ruler, ready to punish, you know, whatever. We might have the different kinds of pictures, but the Bible, the Word of God points to the fact that the Holy Spirit has a range of emotions, right? The Holy Spirit has love. The whole God is love. The Holy Spirit has love, which means the Holy Spirit loves. He's capable of showing, expressing love. The Holy Spirit can be grieved. Okay, what is grief? Sorrow, right? Sadness. The Holy Spirit can be grieved. Um, let's look at um, Ephesians 4, um, verse 30. Okay, it says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 4 and verse 30. Right? It says, um, maybe we should just read verse 29 and verse 30. Verse 29, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that, impart, that it may impart grace to the hearers. And... Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Okay, so what is, the ex uh, what is the exhortation? What is the instruction? Don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Okay, the verse before that, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth. So we can grieve the Holy Spirit. He can be grieved by our words. He can be grieved by our actions and so on. So the Holy Spirit can be grieved. Okay, so that is one of the emotions. So if we had a picture of God being very strict and very, you know, ready to just um, destroy, here is a picture that we see that the Holy Spirit loves and the Holy Spirit is grieved every time we step out of line and speak something or even do something which is which is uh, displeasing right we we uh, grieve him right well wow. next one the holy spirit speaks the holy spirit speaks he communicates he speaks through us he communicates through us, he communicates to us. Acts chapter 13. Um, you know, you can go through all the references in the script in the notes. I'm just picking a few. Okay, uh, any question? Um, yeah, Shani, any question? Yeah, so in terms of grieving, the Holy Spirit is a person, so does he cry? Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, can you tell I me said, again? You said the Holy Spirit is a person. When you grieve him, does he cry? So the Holy Spirit grieves, and does he cry? Is that your question? Yes. Well, we know that Jesus wept. So uh, I would say, yeah. Though we don't have any scriptural, you know, uh, proof, but we know that yes, he's capable of he's capable of grieving, and the expression of grief is to be weeping. So yeah, I would say in my opinion, <laughs> not scripture and verse. Okay, okay. Here's a question by Shaker: If we grieve the Holy Spirit, will he stay or leave? The Bible talks about the Spirit of God separated from. King Saul. Okay. Yeah, Shaker. So we're going to come to that. Uh, I know we have a lot of these questions coming up. So I just want us to be a little patient. Um, but, um, you know, without going into the details, yes, the Holy Spirit is grieved. When he is grieved, does he depart like how we see in the Old Testament? We see that there's a difference in the way the Holy Spirit ministered in the Old Testament and the New. Or, you know, after the cross and uh, you know and 
and we see in the in the teachings of the Lord Jesus how when he ascends to the Father, he will send the Comforter, who the Lord says in John chapter 14, that he will stay with you forever. Okay, So the Holy Spirit has come to indwell the one, the believer, to stay with him or her forever. Okay, So we will look into that. We will study that. We'll see that how he ministered in the old and the new and what is the difference uh, right now. Right, so uh, does he depart as he did in the Old Testament? Uh, well, the answer is no. Right, he does not depart. Can he be grieved? Yes, um, but he has come that we might, by the Spirit, put to death the deeds of the body. Right. Okay. Um, another question from Charles, Matthew twelve thirty one. Okay, wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin, blasphemy, shall be put the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. What refers to the back? Uh, refers to the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, again, that's another thing that we're going to look at. Thanks for bringing that up. We will look at that again, you know. So uh, in the uh, Gospels, we see the Lord Jesus uh, referring to something as the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. You know, that's, that is the scripture that you referenced, Matthew chapter 12. So what did he point? What did he talk about? He talked about the fact that the Pharisees and the scribes were actually saying that the Holy, uh, the Lord Jesus, when he delivered, when he cast out a demon, he did it by the power of Beelzebub. Okay, which means because of satanic power, Satan empowered Jesus to, you know, to cast out is what they were saying. And so the Lord was saying, you know, he was talking about, he's saying that if I cast out demons by the finger of God, the Holy Spirit. Surely the kingdom of God has come upon you, and everything will be forgiven except this blasphemy. So what were they doing, knowing full well that this was a work of God, because every, everybody could testify. Because of them not wanting to lose that position of power, influence, or even wanting to accept the fact that he is the Messiah, they held on to this thinking that, Jesus was doing the things that he did, not by the power of the Holy Spirit, but they were attributing those works to Satan. Okay. Attributing the works of God to Satan. Not unknowingly, but knowingly. Right? Which means that they continued to attribute the works of God to works of the devil. And the Lord Jesus spoke about that as the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit or blaspheming the Holy Spirit and the Lord said that will not be forgiven okay 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 so the Lord speaks the Holy Spirit speaks he expresses and uh, he chooses to speak to his people right Acts chapter um, 13 and verse 2 let's um, go there okay Acts 13 and verse 2 um, very interesting. There's a church, Antioch. People have gathered together. Um, there are the Bible uh, verse one talks about prophets, teachers, um, and then talks about Barnabas, Saul. Everybody's there, and it says that they minister to the Lord and fasted. Okay, what were what were they doing? They're having a prayer meeting. They were having uh, fasting and prayer. That is what we see. And as they ministered, verse 2, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work of ministry to which I have called them. Interesting, right? They were ministering, they were fasting and praying. Maybe they had some petitions. Lord, you need to do this, God. Tell us what to do, or, or you know, people need to be saved, whatever. They, they were praying to the Lord. And it says the Holy Spirit spoke. Look at the clear instructions. Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work which I have called them for. Okay, so God is the Holy Spirit is speaking, the Holy Spirit is instructing, and He's giving names uh, like Barnabas and Saul, and it is to this group. Right? It's again interesting, which means that every person gathered there praying 
in some way or the other felt uh, in their heart, hey, this is what God is, this is what the Holy Spirit is saying, so we better obey. So that's what they did. Verse 3, then having fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, they sent them away. Okay. Now this was a very important decision. They were saying that Barnabas, Saul, you guys need to go, you need to travel, you need to minister. And that instruction to send Paul and Barnabas on this mission uh, came from the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit spoke. So which means that the Holy Spirit has the know-how or the timing and the strategy for our ministry. Right? This was the first missionary journey. This is the first missionary journey. So they went, they shared the gospel, they established churches, and they had a you know they had a great time of ministry. They went to you know all these places, and people were born again. So they this is this is the first of you know uh, the missionary trips, mission trips as we can call. But that instruction is was not a great idea. Which somebody just thought, hey, why don't we just do this? It was actually an instruction of the Holy Spirit. So we see that. Holy Spirit speaks. Now, I remember watching a video, a very interesting video, uh, where this person is, um, is is sitting there and he's praying. He's got a long list of things. He's saying, God, you need to do this. God, you need to do that. And God, you know, this is what it is. This is, you know, the needs. And, uh, and then he has a long list. And then he says, okay, he just takes the list. Lord, the rest of the list, you see it, you know it. You know, you take care of it. And then... And then God begins to speak. And God says, you know, okay, about that thing that you told me, about that thing that you're asking, God begins to just answer this person, and uh, he's already done. You know, he says, he says, amen, and he's moved out. But, but God is like, hey, but, no, I, I'm just going to talk to you now. But he's already moved out. Right? So many times, you know, for us, prayer could be, uh, one direction thing. You know, I take it, I shoot it, I point it, and I shoot. And after I'm done shooting, I pack up and I leave. Right? But we see here, we fasted, they ministered, and uh, and the Lord spoke and they received. Yeah, Shani? Yeah, I hear people say that the Lord, you know, spoke to them, our Holy Spirit, but it's more like of a gut or a feeling. And I hear other people saying it's like an audible voice. And this one he can speak, is this more in terms of an audible voice? Um, did he speak in an audible voice? Okay, so we don't know. Right? We, we, that is not mentioned here. But um, when, we, uh, when we study about the Lord speaking, and when we especially about the gift of word of knowledge and prophecy and so on we see that God you know speaks in a variety of ways right uh, we see that um, visions and dreams a language of the Spirit of God uh, we see that he speaks in promptings and and also not ruling out an audible voice right so we see that God speaks in varieties of ways for example God spoke to Joseph you know the uh, Joseph Mary every time an important instruction came to him in a dream right Take the child, go to Egypt, it was through a dream. Take Mary to be your wife, again a dream. Okay, now we get back, uh, Herod is dead, it's safe to go back, again a dream. Right? So we see that God speaks in different ways uh, and we need to learn, fellowship, commune with the Holy Spirit and, um, and, and more importantly, you know, obey, right? Yeah. So we, uh, yeah, to answer your question, you know, I, I don't know. It's not mentioned here whether it was an audible voice. It could have been, but but the fact is, they knew for sure that this is God speaking, and they acted on it. Right. Okay. So that's all time we have today for today's class. So we'll stop here. Please do go back, refer to the notes, right? Read through, and uh, we'll meet again uh, next class. Okay. God bless. Thank you.